Good evening and welcome to Live and Let Live, the longest running libertarian television show ever, as far as we know. Welcome everybody. My name is Pat Dixon. I'm the chair of the Libertarian Party of Texas and I will be your host tonight. We want to welcome all our viewers tonight. Assuming we have viewers tonight, it is December 22nd, 2007. It is the first day of winter and it's a little cold outside. And that's kind of topical because we're going to be talking about global warming tonight. So we encourage you to watch and actually participate. You can call into this show at the following number, 512-472-2255. But we're going to take your calls in the second half hour of the program. We have a presentation, and in the second half hour, we encourage you to call in and tell me that I'm all wrong or you love what I say, or that I wasted your time, or whatever. So the number to call is 512-472-2255. So it's just a few days before Christmas. We want to wish everybody a happy and uh, blessed Christmas. And let's also hope for a new year filled with prosperity and liberty. Speaking of liberty, I have a few announcements. Liberty not only is a concept we happen to know somebody whose name was Liberty. His name was Terry Liberty Parker. And for many years, he hosted this show. Many of the viewers who are watching this show tonight and have been watching this show for many years remember Terry. Well, Terry passed away recently. He had a tumor in his brain, and he did pass away. So we want to express our sorrow and condolences Honestly, uh, Terry is somebody that I've had some arguments with in the past, and it's not unusual for libertarians to occasionally disagree. But something Terry said is something I think I'll always remember. Revolutions are started by those who show up. Revolutions are started by those who show up. I think that's important to remember. And speaking of showing up, one way you can show up is to support the Travis County Libertarian Party. Every Tuesday, first Tuesday of every month, we have meetings. And those meetings are at the, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the, the library, the old Quarry Library, the old Quarry Library off of uh, uh, Far Hills Avenue. Well, in January, because of New Year's, we're going to reschedule that meeting. It's going to be on Tuesday, January 8th at the El Arroyo restaurant, and the address is 7023, I'm sorry, 7023 Wood Hollow Drive. Again, 7023 Wood Hollow Drive. That's at 7 p.m. Tuesday, January 8th at the El Arroyo restaurant. If you go off of uh, Mopac and take the Far Hills exit, you'll find uh, Wood Hollow Drive there, and we'd love to see you. Revolutions are started by those who show up. Now, showing up is not just showing up at meetings. Libertarians want to show up on the ballot. Several years ago, we had a struggle just to have our name on the ballot. It was very difficult, very expensive. We have a deadline coming up in just a few days to file candidates for the 2008 election. We want to give people a choice, a choice for liberty on the ballot. We'd like to hear from you. We're not asking you to sell your house or raise millions of dollars and knock on every door in the street. Of course, we'd love to have you do that. But the most important thing is just to show up on the ballot. Please go to our state website, lptexas.org. There's information there that will help you understand what we're asking for, and it's a very easy process. We just have to have you fill out a one-page form and send it in to our staff. If you want to call our staff, our executive director, Wes Benedict, would like to hear from you. His number is 512-442-4910. Again, 512-442-4910. You can email him at director at lptexas.org. Again, lptexas.org. So this is the time to show up. Be revolutionary and show up. Now, speaking of showing up, 
I've showed up here tonight to talk about a subject that's getting a lot of interest, not only here in Austin, not only in Texas, not only in the nation, but around the world. And the issue is global warming. We're going to discuss global warming. I'm going to make a presentation in the second half hour. We encourage you to call back and let me know what you think about what I say. The number again is 512-472-2255. In my presentation, I'm going to show you several photos. All these photos and other information pertinent to what I'm talking about is available at my website, patdixon.org. Again, that's P-A-T-D-I-X-O-N dot O-R-G. So if you doubt anything I say, please go there. Look at the information. Not only the information supporting what I'm saying, but also information that tries to refute what I'm saying. I want you to take a balanced look at this because the most important thing is not just to accept it, question it, and decide for yourself. So I want to start with a photo. I want you to look at this first photo. When you look at this photo, a lot of you may not know who I am. You may not know much about me. And what I want to do is explain a little bit about myself. So if you look at this photo, this is me. I am a tree hugger. That's me hugging a tree in California. I was out in California digging a hiking trail. I dig hiking trails all over Central Texas and all over the country. It's volunteer work that I do because I care. I care about the outdoors. Since I was a little child, I played in the woods. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. I think all of us, in some regard, are environmentalists. We all want clean air. We all want clean water. None of us want to live in unlivable situations. So we do care about the environment. But I want to show you something else that we also should care about. I want you to look at this next photo. This is something that you should care about and you should be compassionate about. These children are living in poverty. They are living in dire situations, and they are perishing. You see them inhaling smoke. They're inhaling that smoke because the only fuel they have is wood. The only way they have to heat and feed themselves is to get wood, burn it, and inhale it. You may not think that's a big deal, but that's one of the major causes of death for children in underdeveloped nations. Children are dying. And you saw the reason why. I want you to look at this next photo. I want you to look at this and think about care and compassion. You're seeing the same thing. It's not an isolated incident. That mother and her child are living in poverty. And the only fuel they have is a fuel that they burn in their home and they inhale that smoke and it's killing people. To make this a little more clear, the author Michael Crichton, who wrote Jurassic Park and the TV series ER, said this, 30,000 people a day die of poverty. A third of the planet does not have electricity. A billion people do not have clean drinking water. And half a billion people go to bed hungry every night. And Michael Crichton says it seems that we care more about something that perhaps might happen in a hundred years than something that's happening right now. Well, why is this? Why is this happening? I want you to take a look at this next photo, and it will help explain what's happening. What you see are two graphs. On the left, it's showing that today we have energy. Energy is what you need to have a decent standard of living. You need to have energy to turn on the lights, to heat your home, to turn on your oven without smoke coming out of it, to transport yourself for businesses to have power so that they can make products. 
Our standard of living comes because we do have energy. And the most abundant form of energy that we have right now is fossil fuels. In the future, fossil fuels will become more scarce. They will become more expensive. And we'll need to find alternative sources of energy. We all know this. The fossil fuels will not last forever. Currently, the oil that we know that we have in the ground is supposed to last us about 67 years. That's known oil that we know is there. The amount of natural gas that we have, it should last us 158 years. And the amount of coal that we know we have that we've already found is supposed to last us about 210 years. So we have fuel sources. We have it. It won't last forever, and we'll have to replace it at some time. And when it becomes scarce, it will become more expensive, and people will look for other alternatives, and people already are, and that's good. It's good that we look for alternatives. But people today that are suffering in those underdeveloped nations need energy. They need to be able to raise their standard of living. So what's the problem here? I want you to look at this next photo. This is what the current issue is. This is Al Gore. Al Gore produced a movie called An Inconvenient Truth. I watched it. A lot of people watched it. It was very popular. It won an Academy Award. The work that Al Gore has done has resulted in him receiving a Nobel Prize. What you're looking at here is Al Gore making a presentation. And this is the most important key evidence that Al Gore presents you. Not only does Al Gore present this, our mayor of Austin, Will Wynn, presents this on a regular basis. And what you're looking at is a graph. It is a graph of the weather on the planet Earth over several hundred thousand years. And what you're looking at, there's a red line, which is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And there's a blue line, which is the temperature on the planet Earth over the last hundred thousand years. Al Gore says, look at those two lines. They match up. One follows the other. I agree. Anyone who looks at those lines can see that. In mathematical terms, that's called correlation. When you have two things that follow one another, you say they are correlated. And what Al Gore says is that is proof that carbon dioxide is causing the planet to heat up. That when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it causes the temperature of the Earth to rise. Is he right? Let's think about that. I want you to look at this next photo. This is the same data that Al Gore just presented to you. It's overlapped to show you both on the same axis. You can see that they correlate. The blue line is the temperature on the planet Earth, and the red line is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They follow one another. The question is, what is the cause and what is the effect? Which one causes what? For an example, imagine that you did your own graph and you measured the temperature outside your house, and you also charted how green your grass is in your lawn. Now, right now, my lawn is brown. It's cold outside. And in the winter, the grass tends to turn brown and leaves fall off trees and things like that. But it wasn't brown as soon as it got cold. Not too long ago, it was kind of green. So now it's brown. And it's probably going to get a little browner. But when we go into spring, things start to warm up. But the grass won't be green right away. It'll take a little time. Towards summer, when it's getting hot, 
that grass will probably be green. And then next fall, it's going to go the same way in reverse. Temperatures are going to start falling, but the grass is going to take a while to respond to that. So you can see that one thing follows the other. Now, if I were to go out in my yard tomorrow and put green paint on my lawn, will the temperature go up? Well, of course not. One thing doesn't always cause the other. You have to understand what is the cause and what is the effect. So I want you to look again at that graph I just showed you, the graph of the temperature and the carbon dioxide. Which one is the cause and which one is the effect? Well, we actually know the answer. The scientists that have looked at this and have studied this and have done the mathematical treatment, they all say temperature changes first. The temperature changes hundreds of years before the carbon dioxide changes. The temperature is the cause. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the effect. It is the result. The temperature leads, the carbon dioxide lags. With that information, the most key component of Al Gore's argument, the most important part of Mayor Will Wynn's argument, is gone. So let's look at this next graph and ask ourselves, how can that be? We understand that certain gases can insulate. Certain ins gases can trap heat. Yep, we know that. So how can temperature cause carbon dioxide to go into the atmosphere? How can that happen? Well, this is a graph, and it's showing you that carbon dioxide is always going up in the atmosphere, and it's always being absorbed. I'm going to get back to this graph in a minute, but what I want to show you now is a real example. Here's some soda. Okay, what we have here is some cold water with some sugar. There's some stuff on here. What is this? What is this stuff on here? These bubbles? They're kind of fizzy bubbles. And I don't really like soda that much. But you see these bubbles in it? And you may not see it, but there's bubbles in there. So we have water, sugar, and some bubbles. What are those bubbles? That's carbon dioxide. How did it get in there? Well, this soda was cold. And when water's cold, it can absorb carbon dioxide. But if you take this sugary water and let it warm up, all that gas, all that carbon dioxide effervesces. It goes in the atmosphere. And that soda goes flat. Well, this glass of water, this soda, is like the ocean. The ocean is salty soda. So let's go back to that graph I just showed you a minute ago. What you see on the far left is a red line. On top of the line is 26. That is the amount of industrial carbon dioxide generated. On the planet Earth, when we burn things, we use our fuel, our oil, our coal, our natural gas, and we burn things, it produces carbon dioxide. 26 gigatons per year is going up in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. But look over on the left, on the right, I'm sorry. There's a green line that says 260. That is the amount of gigatons of carbon dioxide that's coming out of the oceans. Water get, the water absorbs some carbon dioxide, and it effervesces some carbon dioxide. And as you saw before in the graph, of the, over the last hundreds of thousands of years, some years, lots of carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere well before we were burning fossil fuels. Sometimes it gets absorbed. 
the temperature of the earth goes up and down and the amount of carbon dioxide goes up and down. But even more than that, look at these green lines that say 440. That's the gigatons of carbon dioxide from respiration, from plants that are absorbing the carbon dioxide and animals that are exhaling it from the plants that die and decay and give it off. The point here is the amount of carbon dioxide generated from fossil fuels is very small portion of the amount of carbon dioxide generated. Additionally, consider this. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If you look at all the molecules in the air, if you had a million molecules of air, only about 300 of those molecules are carbon dioxide. There's lots of nitrogen, lots of oxygen. They don't necessarily contribute to warming or insulating, but water vapor does in abundance. And water vapor is by far a bigger insulator. So to summarize, what I've just shown you is carbon dioxide does go in the atmosphere, but it's not all from fossil fuels. The oceans are a huge source of the carbon dioxide. So what I wanted to have you look at next is if the carbon dioxide is coming out of the ocean and it's going up in the atmosphere, doesn't that mean that we're getting more insulation and isn't that causing the polar ice caps to melt? Have you seen those movies of these big sheets of ice at the polar ice caps and they melt and they break off and fall in the ocean? What's causing that? Well, let's look at this next picture. Yes, there is melting of the polar ice caps on Mars. Yes, on Mars. Not only on Mars, but on Jupiter, on Pluto, the moon Triton of Neptune, uh, scientists have also observed that it is warming. So what's going on here? Are there Martians driving SUVs around, putting carbon dioxide in the air and heating up Mars? Are Plutonians burning coal in their power plants and putting carbon dioxide in the air? It's interesting that we have several objects in our solar system that are warming at the same time. How can that be? Could it be there's something in common to all these objects in the solar system? Yeah, have you ever noticed that if you look up in the sky and you see a big yellow thing that's on fire? That's common to every object in our solar system. And it's not constant. It changes over time. Sometimes the sun is hotter. Sometimes it's cooler. So, yeah, the sun does change in intensity. Does that mean it's going to get hotter and hotter forever? Is this global warming just going to keep going up and up and up? Let's look at this next slide. And there's an answer. There's more than one way to measure temperature on the planet Earth. You can measure it at the surface. But a lot of scientists use satellites to measure the temperature in a layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere. In the troposphere, that's how you can tell whether you really have global warming occurring. If carbon dioxide is building up and that heat is being trapped, it would be trapped in the troposphere. So you see a trend of the temperature of the troposphere. What you see is, yes, there has been some temperature increase. But notice the last 10 years. The last 10 years have pretty much been uh, flat. You had a big peak there in 1998. But in the last few years, it's kind of leveled off. And as a matter of fact, most of the data is showing now the temperature is coming back down. What scientists say is this would be proof that there is not global warming. If you were to see real global warming and real insulation, 
you would see those temperatures continue to go up and up and up. That doesn't appear to be happening. I want to show you this next slide. Yeah, okay, so we measured temperature in the troposphere. But I'm down here on the planet Earth. I'm, I live down here in the surface. I'm not a bird. I don't live in the air. Isn't it getting hotter here? Well, let's take a look at this next photo. This is how some of those temperature records are being derived. What you see is something called an MMTS. Up in the upper right, an MMTS. That is a temperature measurement. That temperature measurement is being used to tell you what the temperature on the surface of the planet Earth is. They have these all over the planet in many places. But what you'll notice is that temperature measurement is being made right next to an exhaust fan, next to a refrigeration unit, on concrete, next to an air conditioner. It, you have a sh shaded part that during some times of the day comes over the measurement, sometimes it doesn't. Do you think you're going to get an accurate measurement of temperature from this sensor? I think most of you understand that if you measured temperature on a very hot day on asphalt, you may get a different measurement than if you measured it on your front lawn. You may get a different measurement in the shade than in the sun. The point here is this picture is not an isolated incident. Meteorologists have been going all over the country and inspecting these installations. And they find these installations are not giving accurate numbers. So when you see data that says this is the hottest summer ever, we're not really sure. As a matter of fact, NASA's not sure. NASA has been making corrections to some of their historical measurements because of this. They're starting to see that some of these measurements are not being done properly. So you have to think, is it really getting hotter? We're not really sure. Being that this is important information and this is the basis of what Al Gore and Austin Mayor Will Wynn are talking about, we better be sure that the numbers are right. So let's recap a little bit. If you've heard anything that you disagree with, you think I'm completely wrong, call me. 512-472-2255. Call the show. We'll put you on the air and we'll talk about it. If you think I'm right on, call me. If you think I'm wasting your time, call me. Just give us a call. 512-472-2255. So we've talked about these graphs. We've looked at the temperature on the planet Earth. And Al Gore says carbon dioxide is causing the warming. But the data says differently. It says temperature is changing. It could be the temperature is changing because the intensity of the sun is changing. And it does change. We know that. We know that there are people in developing nations that are suffering they do not have modern standards of living. They need the kind of infrastructure, the kind of clean energy that we have here. So what's stopping that? Well, many of you might be thinking that, look, I'm just Pat Dixon. I'm not a, client, uh, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a meteorologist. Who am I to say whether there's global warming or not? Don't all the scientists say there's global warming? Let's look at this next photo. And it will show you something that you may not have seen before. This next photo is information that you really do need to see. Because when we talk about the scientific consensus, it's important that you understand what the consensus is. So let's look at this next photo. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen this before. This is a study where they went out and asked scientists, do you believe in global warming? A lot of them don't. You seem to hear a lot about 
the unanimous consensus of the United Nations and their IPCC committee saying that all the scientists agree that man is causing global warming. There are many scientists that disagree with that. I'm just going to give you a few examples of what a few scientists say about this. There is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University named David Wojcik. He was one of the reviewers on the United Nations IPCC committee. He says, in point of fact, the hypothesis that solar variability and not human activity is warming the oceans goes a long way to explaining the puzzling idea that the Earth's surface may be warming while the atmosphere is not. Remember, we looked at that troposphere data. That's what he's talking about. He also says the public is not well served by this constant drumbeat of false alarms fed by computer models manipulated by advocates. This is a professor who was on the IPCC review committee. Let's try another one. It's not just one scientist. There's a client, climate scientist named Luc Debentritter. He's in Belgium. He's with the Belgium Weather Institute's Royal, Royal Meteorological... Uh, let's try that again. <laughs> He's with the Belgium Weather Institute's Royal Meteorological Institute. So what does he say? CO2, carbon dioxide, is not the big bogeyman of, cl of climate change and global warming. Not CO2, but water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. It is responsible for at least 75% of the greenhouse effect. This is a simple scientific fact, but Al Gore's movie has hyped CO2 so much that nobody seems to take note of it. Al Gore and Mayor Will Wynn of Austin are hyping this. I'll give you just one more. Dr. Richard Courtney. He's also an IPCC expert reviewer out of Britain. He's a climate and atmospheric scientist, science consultant. He says, to date, no convincing evidence for man-made global warming has been discovered. And recent global climate behavior is not consistent with man-made global warming model predictions. I give you three examples. There are at least 400, and there are many more. As a matter of fact, there is a petition signed by over 19,000 people who have degrees in the physical sciences, in the, the physical science, sciences, PhDs, and so forth. Over 19,000 people have signed a petition. And this petition says that there is no evidence that human production of greenhouse gas is causing catastrophic global warming. The point of all this is you're being told that the scientific consensus is conclusive. You're being told by Mayor Will Wynn of Austin and Al Gore that the debate is over. There's no point in even talking about it anymore. That is not true. The debate still goes on because there are questions that are unanswered. So I see there's a caller on the line, and I've got just one more point before I get to this caller. I will make sure I get to this caller. But I want to show you this next photo. What is the motive of some of these people? I believe some of these people have sincere motives. I believe a lot of you may believe that the man is causing global warming. And I believe you're being sincere in that. The scientific debate is good. As long as it's honest and good, that, that's where you all benefit from that. But let's take a look at this next photo. This is Dr. Patrick Moore. You might guess that he's an environmentalist. He's out there in the woods. He's sitting in front of a tree. Well, who's Dr. Patrick Moore? He is the founder of Greenpeace. You might call him an environmentalist. He was the founder of Greenpeace. He was concerned about some of the abuse of the environment, and he got involved, and he founded an organization. But he left that organization. Why did he leave Greenpeace? He founded this organization for a cause that he deeply cared about, and he left. Why? 
Patrick Moore says that what happened is communism fell. Communism fell, the Berlin Wall fell, and there were socialists and leftists that needed a cause to get behind. They had to find a way to get their message out, and they found the environmental movement. And they found Greenpeace. And Dr. Patrick Moore, who founded that organization, said he had to leave because these people took it over, and instead of really being concerned about environmental causes, they were concerned about left-wing agenda, about damaging free markets, about damaging the standard of living that we have. Not all people who believe in global warming are those people. But Dr. Patrick Moore, who I think would know about this, says that is a major contributor to the hype, that these people are finding this cause and it's their way of impairing development, of impairing the standard of living that we have. So I want to close and get to this phone call. I want to bring up those first photos I showed you when I started this presentation. I want to bring up that photo, and I want you to look at these two children. I want you to think about these two children as you look at this photo. These are the people who suffer. These are the people who need a modern standard of living, who need clean energy, who need clean water, who benefit from the kind of wealth, the kind of economic strength that we have. The effect of the types of things that Al Gore and Mayor Will Wynn are talking about is to impair development, is to hurt these people, is to hurt us, is to hurt us economically. We have to care and be compassionate for everyone. I understand the concern about global warming, but it's important we get the science right. It's important we don't go out in our yards, try to throw green paint on the grass and hope we warm or cool the atmosphere. It's important we use the correct science. So let's be compassionate and be careful. That concludes my presentation. And I have a call on the line. So I'm going to see if this call uh, says I'm full of it or that they like what I say or whatever. So line one, hello, you're on the air. Uh, you're right on the money, and I have a question for you. Oh, good. Well, thank you very much. Go ahead. Have you ever heard of fear politics and milking the goats? Fear politics. Well, yeah. I've heard of fear politics as a concept, or is that a website, or what? No, no, no. As a concept. Yes, I've certainly do, heard uh, of do that. Do you understand that, 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 that from a political standpoint, you need to keep the people scared of things, and 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 you got to come up with carbon footprint taxes so you can get the UN involved and collecting a bunch of money, and... And you got to get toll roads, and you got to have terrorist organizations and domestic terrorism. Well, we certainly broaden the uh, the topic, haven't we? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I understand your point. Uh, just to be real honest with you, I personally am not a. I don't get into conspiracies that much. I understand. I, understand. Uh, be, I, I was on city council for a couple of years, and out in Lago Vista. And I didn't really see conspiracies because I saw things that were obviously not right. Yeah. Things that I just don't agree with, and this is one of them. So right. I understand what you're talking about, fear politics, and that's used. Oh, yeah. It's certainly Absolutely. used. All well, around the world. What was the second thing you talked about? Uh, milk and the goats. Milk and the goats. Yeah, that's the, that's the tax streams. They, they'll they have to come up with a big departments to... For the taxpayer to flood them with cash and mm. and all kind of offshore bank accounts can be created and I mean those things are those are those are great little items to play mm. around with. Well, when you said goats, see, we have a friend named Vince May, and he has goats. So I th I thought you were talking about Vince. No, Sorry, I, I'm basically <laughs> talking about the sheeple. Okay, yeah, so, or the serfs and peasants. That's that's basically what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the books that 
I remember reading was by a French uh, person named Etienne Labossi. Mm-hmm. And he, read a, he wrote a book called, uh, I, I th- think the title was On Involuntary Servitude. And the point he made in the book was, you may have one king, and he may have a bunch of soldiers, but there are more of you. And if people stand up, right. they outnumber the, the power. You are absolutely correct. So, uh, you know, I, I started the show by talking about Terry Liberty Parker. Right and uh, Terry, that quote he made, that revolutions start by people who show up. Right. That you got to start by showing up. Right. You start by showing up at your city council meetings. And I encourage you, anytime you have an opportunity to get in front of Mayor Will Wynn of Austin and tell him that you do not accept his science. Well, you you laid it out perfectly clear right there. I mean, you you uh, I, I couldn't ask for a better presentation. I mean, it's 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 painfully clear to me. Well, great. Maybe I did such a good job that nobody's calling in except you. <laughs> but maybe I did too good a job. But well, I... you got to realize this is Christmas weekend, man. Oh, and, I'm sure. Yeah, everybody. People are still down at Walmart getting their Chinese poison <laughs> toys for the kids for Christmas. Well, there, some of them are going to the domain. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, just to touch on that, today, earlier today, we were at protesting at the domain. And you, some of you may know that $65 million out of our tax pockets out of our pockets is being taken by the city of austin to give to the developer of the domain yeah that's yet another example there are those who i don't know that they're they're evil or anything like that they just simply believe that government should make those decisions right well see uh the all of our politicians in washington right now are scrambling to make a huge bureaucracy to test all these toys for these for these uh, um, uh, corporations, and, and taxpayers are going to pay for to to test these poison toys that these criminal corporations are shipping into our country. Yeah, hey, where are we living, man? Well, you I know, I saw a program on Russia a while ago talking about Putin's. Uh, killing people over there and everything to silence them and all this kind of, we're, we're not too far from there. I mean, we're, we're, we're in bad shape. Well, you know, being a libertarian, we favor smaller government. And part of that responsibility should be when you have an incident of fraud, if somebody sells you something and says, here's what it is, and it turns out to be something not what it is, it's good that we have a court system Maybe our court system isn't that good right now, but at least you have a system where you don't have to be violent. You can bring something forward and settle it peacefully. That is a proper role for government. But the idea that government has to be everywhere all the time and make sure that everything is exactly perfect, there's there's ways to address things that don't involve government all the time. So the least amount, the best. That works for us. <laughs> All right, man. You have a good one. Well, and hey, I, th- I appreciate your call. Okay. That was our one and only caller so far. If you want to call back, we got plenty of airtime for you. Oh, about uh, 15 minutes. So the number is 512-472-2255. If you want to call in and say, you know what, Pat? Yeah, I saw your whole global warming thing, and you're full of it. You don't know what you're talking about. Call me. This is your opportunity to address it. I'm not going to bite your head off. I'd like to discuss this professionally, rationally. If there's something I'm overlooking, tell me what it is. And we have a caller right now. I guess I provoked somebody. So here we go. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, Yes. uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. I'm on my speakerphone on cell phone. So anyways, um. A big debate that is not getting debate time anywhere, even in an alternative press, is the peak oil debate. Now, I, I for one, have a radical view, and I don't believe in peak oil, even though I don't support big oil either. I support solar energy and alternative energy. But I don't support the idea that we are running out of oil either. What's your comment on that? Well, 
clearly at some point in time, we will, we will run to a point of exhaustion on fossil fuels. Would you agree with me on that? At some point in time, we're going to be using it faster than it's being made. Well, no one, uh, you're not a geologist and I'm not a geologist, so we're both not qualified to answer that question. But my belief is the abiotic oil theory, which the Russians came up with, and they found out that deep within the earth, the oil replenishes itself over time. Now, that's just coming from the Russians, though. Well, I've not heard that. Now, you know, just, I, by the way, I am an engineer, I'm, but I'm not a geologist or whatever. I'm a, I work in industrial facilities. But I know a bit of engineering. And to me, when plants or animals die and they decay, you have microbes that work on them. And the result of that organic matter is what becomes oil, is what becomes fossil fuels. And it seems intuitive to me that the rate at which that decay is happening is not as fast as what we're using. I may be wrong, but it seems rational to me that at some point in time, the fossil fuels are going to become more scarce and more expensive. But as far as peak oil, I don't know. We really don't know to what degree we've explored the earth. There may be reserves that we haven't tapped yet. So, I, you know, I, I mentioned before how much coal, how much oil, how much natural gas we know we have. Will we find more? Maybe. But the most important thing is there is a way to regulate that properly, and that's through the market. When something's scarce, it should be more expensive. When something's abundant, it should be more affordable. If we take that approach, that's the best approach. Would you agree with me on that? I agree with you on that, but I don't agree on false um, belief structures supporting ideas. And the fact is that dinosaur bones that have been brought, uh, dug up do not yield high oil areas. So that correlation does not hold any water. Okay, how about the vegetation? Vegetation. Like, right. Vege like, you know, th throughout history you have vegetation that dies, decays, goes down. The If you go out to Rockdale, where Alcoa is, you see lignite in the, in the ground. And they use that lignite to heat the, uh, the furnaces to make aluminum. Well, that lignite is the result of plant material, right? right? That was decayed plant material. Yeah, that's the theory. I, I understand it. It's really hard to prove it either way. There was a debate on coast to coast between um, Rupert, Michael, or Rupert from the Wilderness Guy, and Jim Corsi, and they debated for four hours or whatever. And at the end, they had a um, call in. Uh, uh, See who won the debate, and 75 percent of the people chose Horsey, who had the uh, abiotic oil theory. Hmm. I've n I just have never heard that. And uh, again, I'm not a geologist. You may be right, but it may be a situation where you know a lot of us we can't spend all our time studying everything. This global warming thing is something that we do need to understand because it's starting to affect policy in a big way, right here in Austin, Texas. Our city council and Mayor Will Win are starting to make it almost impossible for anyone to build anything, anyone to do anything. So I understand your point. Uh, it may be something I need to understand better. But uh, in terms of this global warming debate, there's a lot of science that's not being talked about. All right. Thanks for the call. Well, hey, thank you very much for calling in. Bye. Okay. Two calls. All right. So what I want to discuss again. Let me mention the phone number again. Oh, we got another call. So let's go right to it. Hello, you're on the air. Hello, you're on the air. Hey, Pat. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I, I agree with you. I've, about 15 years ago, I used to believe that this global warming thing was real, but the more information I got, uh, and, and really now it's just a grab for, for power and money and world government, I've there. I don't know if you've ever uh, accessed the website junk, junkscience.com. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yeah, they do a really excellent job. And there's also a British-made uh, TV documentary yes. called "The Great Global, the Great Global Warming, Warming Swindle. Swindle." 
That's yeah, right. and I haven't even watched the whole thing about that. But you, if you uh, believe in man-made global warming, you have to look at the other pieces of evidence. Yes. And on this local issue, I mean, you know what? Like Will Win and his little little gestures to to this tiny spot on the earth of Austin, Texas, doing these things to prevent global warming. It remi- reminds me back in the early days of the Clinton administration. We had big uh, uh, government deficits, and this little teenager out in the Midwest or somewhere sold some of his toys and sporting mm-hmm. goods stuff and, and raised about $300 and sent it to the mm-hmm. federal government to uh, – eradicate this multi-trillion dollar deficit and i mean that's that's like doing these tiny things that actually think they're going to have an impact and i don't believe it for one minute i mean al gore has no credibility in my book i think the man is just Mm. terrible well (laughs) so uh yeah and the people that run this city are just so disconnected from reality and they they know they're not looking at all the scientific evidence Mm. Well, I want to. Uh, you, you touched on a few things that I'd like to comment on. First, you mentioned those videos, the British video called the global warming global warming swindle. Right. If you try to find that on Google, you won't find it. Hmm. But I have that at my website, patdixon.org. Okay. If you go to patdixon.org, right at the top, you'll see that, and right under that is also a Canadian documentary that covers the same material, but interviews some different people and dis- and discusses some different aspects of it. So those two videos, those documentaries, I highly recommend, and they're hard to find. So if you go to pantdixon.org, I recommend anyone who wants to discuss this issue ought to look at those. The other thing you mentioned about Will Wynn. Now, I don't hate Will Wynn. I don't hate too many people, really. I've met him. I know, I know Mayor Wynn. It may just be that we have a difference of opinion. Uh, Maybe there's an agenda he has or something. But I have attended him doing this presentation. Uh And what he's done is invited all the surrounding cities to attend these presentations. I was on city council out in Laga Vista. So all these city council members came in for this presentation. What he's trying to do, I think, is to get all the cities in this area to adopt these kind of anti-growth policies. So what you see in Austin may start to happen in all these cities around Austin. So my, I encourage you to get involved in your city council wherever you live around here and make sure this doesn't get out of hand. And the last point I want to make, you mentioned about the person who raised uh, $300 and for a cause. Now, I, I, don't, I don't see anything wrong with that, of course. Uh, it may be a small drop in the bucket. So I don't... As far as the effect of Austin's climate on the rest of the world, of course, you know, you're not going to change the whole Earth's climate just from Austin. But I think what Mayor Will Wynn is thinking is this little drop in the bucket is going to lead to another drop, another drop, another drop. He wants to see that in Round Rock, and he wants to see that in Lago Vista and Jonestown and all these cities and to spread it all over the place. So I think that's the idea he has in mind. So I just wanted to comment on those things. You brought up some good points. All right. Well, what did you think of the present? Did I, was I persuasive at all? Actually, I just came back from the grocery store about <laughs> 10 minutes ago, and I just started watching. <laughs> okay, well, that's okay. So, did, yeah. you, did you mention that 15 years ago you believed in the global warming thing, but you changed your mind, right? Right. Now, when you, 15 years ago, when you believed in it, what convinced you that man is causing the earth to warm up? What, what was it? I, I guess uh, probably that it just would seem plausible that with increasing uh, po- world population and more people uh, pumping uh, CO2 into the atmosphere, that this would have a cumulative effect mm-hmm. on ra- raising the Earth's temperature. But uh, I guess mostly it started with uh, Limbaugh, and he was, he was on that. Uh, I'm not as much of a fan of him as I used to be. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he 
did some really good work uh, uh, back then, and there was this uh, lady scientist who I believe has now passed away, Dixie Lee Ray, and she had a lot of evidence way back then uh, disputing the uh, mainstream views on this subject, and that really stuck with me. Uh, so uh, yeah, so you're a case where you know I'm sure a lot of people today are like what you were 15 years ago. They look at it and they hear what's on the television and what's in the newspaper, and they think, well, there's this consensus. It's got to be right. But you've you've studied it enough to question it, to understand the scientific arguments a little bit. You right. don't have to be a scientist or an engineer. You just have to be someone who uses some rational thought and understands. They say this, but there's a lot of evidence that, that, that says that's not true. So the whole point is to question it. Right. I, I don't. I don't want anyone to go away from this and say, "I'm I'm convinced and I'm not going to believe it anymore." If you have questions, look at the research. Look at the stuff on my website. I have stuff that's for and against. Make up your own mind, and and we'll all be better off. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, thank you very much for calling in. Okay, three callers, and there's only about two minutes left in the show, so I just want to close. Gary, if you can bring up that very first, uh, the second photo of those two, two children again. I want to bring this up because I want to close the show by looking at this photo. That's, this is photo number two for Gary. This is the thing I want you to take away from this presentation. There are those who will tell you, hey, why not fight this global warming thing? It won't hurt. And even if we're wrong, it won't hurt anyone. These children will be hurt. They're being hurt today. People throughout the developing nations are being hurt. They're called developing nations because you can see the standard of living they have now. They want to develop in Africa, in South America, in Asia. They want to survive. They want to have good lives, the kind of lives that most of us are used to, where we have lights, where we come into a warm home, where we can turn on the oven and not inhale smoke, where they can transport themselves, where businesses can produce goods and services, where we can have a healthy economy and healthy people. Remember this photo. Anytime you consider this global warming issue, remember this photo. Remember the effect of people who want to stop development. That's going to impact those people. It's going to impact us to some degree. That's the important thing I want you to remember. Take a look at the information on my website. Search around. Study the issue. Mayor Will Wynn and Al Gore, they may be sincere, but they have to be held accountable. Thank you very much for tuning in tonight. I appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you later.